Is that... <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's pray. Um, we're in chapter 15. We left off at verse 10. We're going to get to verse 31. There's quite a few references today, so try to hang in there. If you don't understand something, just raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. No, don't do that, because everybody will be raising their hand. I don't think that's a good idea. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time we can gather together. Lord, we ask that as we go through these verses, Lord, you'd explain them and expound them to us, Lord. Um, such an important chapter about how to get to heaven, Lord, that, that it's grace, Lord, that it's all you, Lord, um, that without you, we can't do anything. So Jesus, help us to rely on your finished work, Lord. We pray that you would speak to us from the borders of another world. Bring the atmosphere of heaven to this very room by the power of your spirit. Take the things that belong to you, Jesus, and real, reveal them to each one of our hearts, um, all on our different uh, 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 journeys and difficulties, Lord. But Lord, you have the answer for each one of us. So speak to each individually, Lord. We want to leave here loving you more. We each want our portion, we pray in your name. Amen. Okay. Paul and Barnabas at this point have returned from their first missionary journey. God has been working and many Gentiles have come to faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, um, the Jewish Messiah. So they come back to Antioch where they started their first missionary journey and they rehearse everything that's been going on uh, as they visited these places in Asia Minor and in Cyprus. Um, they're telling them about all the danger-filled details and everything. So some time passes while they're in Antioch and a group of representatives not sent by the leadership arrive in Antioch, Jewish people, and they start to teach that these Gentiles who came to know the Lord by faith, they must be circumcised and they have to follow the law of Moses to enter in to, to a, a saving knowledge of who Jesus is, their Messiah. Um, they believe Christianity now, for them, and, and rightly so, all they have is the Old Testament. They believe Christianity is the completion of Judaism, and it is. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill it. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets perfectly, so that when he took that perfect life to the cross, he could pay for our sins in full. So that we can receive the grace of God through Jesus Christ, which is forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, when they hear that, they just have faith in that. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is have faith that Jesus Christ did that for them, and that work is completed. Now they're saying, oh, you need more to be saved. Circumcision, you got to follow the rules and regulations of Judaism. Now, as you go along, as you follow the missionary journey, that hasn't been the case. Um, as Paul and Barnabas share the gospel, the Holy Spirit has given signs and miracles to authenticate the gospel, and these people didn't do anything to receive the signs. The Holy Spirit fell on them. Just, they just got saved by believing. So there's this big dispute, heated dispute. In fact, Grace is on trial. Is the grace of God enough to save you? Do you need something more? Do you need to do something? Do you need to follow some religion? Do you need to join a Catholic church? Do you need to join Calvary Chapel? Do you need to get circumcised? Do you need to worship on Saturday instead of Sunday? All these laws and rules, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what is necessary to be saved. So it's a critical point. It can go either way. It's grace versus law is what it is. So people, at this point, they're looking on the outward to try to judge an inward work. You got to be circumcised. You got to follow the laws of Moses. You got to do this stuff, ceremony. And, and they're going to judge what God's doing in your heart by outward observations of the flesh, basically. So the Gentiles are stepping right in to the grace of God by faith alone. And that's proven by miracles being given without them doing anything. And it's proven by the Holy Spirit coming upon them. So Peter stood up, he's recounted what the Holy Spirit did for Cornelius in his house and how God put no difference between us, the Jews, and the Gentiles. So they're having this big powwow, this big conference in Jerusalem to settle this dispute, what is necessary to be saved. We ended with verse 11. I'm going to read 10 and 11 as we're going to take it a running start to get into this. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? Peter speaking. To put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. We have all these laws. We got 10 on Mount Sinai. We added 600 to them. We're always adding to them. 
we're, we're, we have positive laws, negative laws. We can never follow them. We argue about which ones to follow. And it's a yoke, a religious yoke that Jesus even said, I didn't, you know, he would, he would argue about all their laws all the time. Turn over their money changers tables. Tell them when they're in the fields and they're eating the, the corn on the Sabbath day, they're saying, you're not doing what's lawful. And Jesus says, it's not in the scripture. Jesus never broke the law. He broke their traditions. He says, they make out the traditions of men and turn them into the law of God. That is wrong. Traditions of men are not what God ordains in this world. Men ordain traditions, so you'll follow them. Big difference. So he says, look, we weren't able to follow it. We weren't able to do it. Our fathers weren't able to bear it. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to get saved just the same way they're saved in this present dispensation that God has given us, everybody gets saved by grace through faith. There's no difference between Jew, Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ. So salvation is the same for both Jew and Gentile, which wasn't the case before Jesus came. Before Jesus came, the Bible always said in the back of the just shall live by faith. You had to believe that God, the in the creator God, and you had to believe that he would forgive your sins. But that was added to the law. You had to follow the law. It was faith plus law. Faith plus following what God wants. The commandments of God plus faith in God. And when you died before the cross, when you died, you went to a place called Abraham's bosom. It wasn't until when Jesus died on the cross and rose and went to heaven that souls go directly to God now go to heaven. Heaven is open to mankind before it wasn't. So he led captivity, Jesus did, and gave good gifts to men. What was captive? The souls of men. We couldn't go to heaven because there was nothing, there was no sacrifice in heaven for mankind to be reunited with God. Jesus Christ has reunited us to God. He was the perfect fulfillment of the law, and all, he is the sacrifice for our sins. It's completed once and for all. So to get in, all you have to do is believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And guess what happens when you die? You go straight to heaven. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. The Gentiles are like coming right into that. Now they want to bring all this law that they had before. How much law do you need to get to heaven? You don't need any of it. It's already been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So he's saying, look, we're going to get saved the same way they are. Now there's no need to shackle people with the yoke of religion that we could never bear. Paul will expound this on this in the book of Galatians. Very important you read chapter 15 with the book of Galatians. He's going to be chased from town to town by Judaizers who want to drag everybody back under the law. That you're saved by keeping the law. So are you saved by keeping the law, being a good person, or are you saved by the blood of Jesus? Because you can't have both now. That's what he's saying. So we, we got to stay away. The problem with this is, is as we walk with Christ, we start comparing ourselves among ourselves and we judge salvation by the outward, what we see, how a person dresses. Have they been baptized? Do they wear suits to church? Evidently, we're probably really badly judged as a church. <laughs> what I'm saying is all the outward observations of what you would think, oh, that person's holier, this person's more righteous. All those things are, are, are meaningless when it comes to an inward work that God is doing in our hearts. Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, it's not wise to do what these Judaizers are doing. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. So we're, we're commending ourselves by what we do. We don't do that. We don't do this. We don't drink. We don't smoke. And we don't chew. And we don't go out with the girls who do. We don't do any of that. So we're commendable. Not like you people. Not, you know what I mean? That's how, that's how people are. They measure themselves by themselves and compare, compare themselves among themselves. They're not wise. It's foolish. The Bible says this, as you therefore have found Christ Jesus, Colossians 2.10, as you received Christ, when you received him into your heart as your personal savior, that's the way you're supposed to walk with him. How did you receive Jesus? Did you do anything? You just prayed a prayer, correct? And said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. I need you in my life. Forgive me. Move into my heart. Move into my life. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I know I deserve to go to hell. I've done a lot of bad stuff. I'm a mess. Lord Jesus, can you forgive me by the power of your blood? Can you make me a son? Make me your daughter. Apply your blood to my life. I want to go to heaven. I want to be your son. I want to be your daughter. Bear me from above. Make me, make me one of yours. And he's faithful to do it because he paid for you in full. You don't do any, you can't do anything to earn that. You can't add to that. 
So after you receive that grace of God, that wonderful gift, free gift, why do you desire to come back under the law or to make your salvation more perfect by doing law, by doing things that you think God's going to be more pleased with you? The gospel of grace runs counterintuitive to everything we've ever been taught or trained since we were little. Do good, get good stuff. Do bad, get spanked. That's the first thing you learn. Then it gets more nuanced as you get older. You know what I mean? Like, okay, you know, show up on time, do this, do that, and eventually I'll get, uh, I'll get the uh, raise. I'll, I'll get noticed. I'll keep doing good. And, and the same thing with, with, with even, even the most intimate love of all, a husband and a wife. My wife loves me more when I clean a kitchen for her. I don't know why, but I think she just really does. <laughs> Should she? I don't know. I don't think so. She should love me if I just lay there and, and get served all day, right? <laughs> but we, we tend to like people when they do or when, when, they, when they perform really well. There's nothing you can do to perform to get God to receive you into his kingdom. God had to perform the work, and it was ordered from the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would be slain. That, that forgiveness was set in place for every human being that ever lived, because I can tell you what, you can try to perform your whole life, and you'll never perform enough for God to receive you on your own accord, no matter how good you think you are. Now, you can't come back under the law and make your salvation more perfect. It's already perfect. So some will say, well... We should judge fruit, and we should. The Bible says, Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them. Um, James, who's going to talk here in a minute, will say, I'll show you my faith by my works. Writes a whole epistle. Very, very geared towards the law. He was very Jewish. You can tell by his, his, his epistle. But you can never judge a person's salvation by a limited outward observation. You do not have enough information Jesus would tell a great parable in Matthew chapter 13. I won't go there for, lack, for time, but it's about the wheat and the tares. The problem is he's creating a kingdom and there's wheat, people that are really born again, and there are tares that are sown among the wheat. The angels come and they say, Lord, didn't you sow good seed? He said, yeah, my word's solid. It's good. But the problem is while men slept, while they became complacent, the enemy came into their churches and he planted tares. So they say, hey, let us go in and tear out the tares. That's what I want to do. Let's go tear on. I see a bunch of them on TV all the time. Let's pull them all out. Jesus says, no, don't do that because you just might pull out some wheat while you're trying to pull out the tares. Wheat is so valuable. He says, let them all grow together. I'll take care of that at the end of the age. So do yourself a favor. Don't be so judgmental. Make sure you got something real with God and that's your wheat. The tares will be torn up and they will be cast into the fire. Don't worry about them. Peter talks about them. There's going to be false teachers as there was in the nation of Israel. So there will be in the church. Those are things that are going to happen. Those are going to go. Make sure you know the word of God. Make sure you're under solid ground with the teaching that you, that you, that make sure it's doctrinally correct. Make sure you're walking in the spirit. Make sure that you're following the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the most important things. But to judge somebody's salvation by what they wear, how they eat, what they look like, what music they play at church, uh, basically, I mean, think about it. When I got saved, I went into a church. I didn't look very saved because I had a mullet, and I was a little weird. <laughs> kind of sat in the back, you know? Now, if you're judging by looks, you know, you would say, ah, I'm not so sure about that guy, or I'm not so sure about that girl. If, if, if a prostitute, like I said last week, came into this room, even if she was out last night, just got convicted, and you know what? She was led here, and she sits down. She wants to hear the gospel. She gives her heart to Jesus. If we all judge her, and she turns around and walks out because she doesn't feel welcome, then she's not going to hear the good news. Amen. So be very careful on how you do that. Man looks on the outward. God looks on the heart. In essentials, which means the gospel, that there's only one way to the Father, that's through Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man, there's unity in that. If a church doesn't agree with that, they're not, church, they're not the church. So there's unity in that. Non-essentials, there's liberty. And in all things, the Bible says we're supposed to have love. And so often people are ready to break fellowship over some of the most mundane things. What you wear, how you worship, what music you tolerate. Now, be discerning too. I mean... I wouldn't say, like, there are some movies you probably shouldn't be watching that aren't good for you, that aren't good to fill your mind with. And, and pray for me, because I like gangster movies, so pray for me. 
sometimes I'm watching, I'm saying, this is not healthy. You know, they're just killing this guy and they're putting him in the trunk. It's not good. I shouldn't probably be watching this. And I finish it. So pray for me. I got to see who dies and who lives in the gangster world. It's stupid, right? Not expedient. So, you know, I try to limit that and I try not to do that. So be discerning. Um, but don't be judgmental. Um, the list goes on and on. You could go on and on about these things. So the council will settle this matter. What is needful for salvation? As we walk with Christ, I think the problem is most of us like to be comfortable and religion is very comfortable because I can follow some guy's things and I can follow my priest and I can give money to the church and they can accept me. He can do this and I can, I can do that. I can kneel, I can stand, I get all that. And then I'm out the door and I'm saved. That's how we like to feel because it's easier to follow that than it is to walk with Jesus. Because walking with Jesus, that's when he talks to you and says, you know, you don't probably don't need to be watching this. You should be reading my word. You know what I mean? You're wasting time here, Matt. Or you're doing this. That's walking with Jesus. That's continually transforming me into his image and likeness. It's a big difference in religion. Much, much different. So Peter's declared the way of salvation. And he says, look, it's not through religion. It's through grace. We're sanctified by grace. We're brought home by grace. Now, Paul and Barnabas want to share what God did in the present to back up Peter's assertion. In verse 12, then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. So God was, was doing miracles for these Gentiles, okay? The one guy just heard the message, remember, and he had Paul said, I think he's ready to get saved. And Paul heals the man right away. The man didn't do anything to receive that grace of a healing, did he? No. Jews require, he would say, a sign. So they're given the Jews here. These are all the signs that God is doing that he's working this way with the Gentiles, that it's by faith. The miracles were granted by God as evidence that salvation is by grace, not by the works of the law. Now, did God give these miracles because they observed the law? No. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Read that for you quickly. Let you understand what he says here. Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, the Galatians were being brought back onto the law. The whole book is about this. Who hath bewitched you? Who's put a spell on you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you openly? This only what I learn of you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? I mean, when we came and preached you and gave you the gospel, did we ask any works of the law for you? Circumcision, anything else? Torah observance? Or you had to read the first, the first five books? No. Or by the hearing of faith. You heard the gospel and you believed. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit that now you're going to be made complete or perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you or supplieth to you the spirit. You were supplied the spirit from God and worketh miracles among you. God did that. Did he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did these miracles happen by the works of the law or because you had faith? question when you got saved did things drop off of your life because you did works no but because christ was working in you Amen. that's the miracle those miracles happened by faith so the whole record of the first missionary journey is what god did in response to faith not the law it was all faith there wasn't anything to do with the law paul says a door of faith was open unto us to the gentiles to preach the mystery of christ the mystery of Christ is the fact that any human being in any condition, any time of life, even in their last moments of life, can turn to Jesus Christ and be washed and cleansed and be set forth as a new creation in Christ and make it straight to heaven based on what Jesus did. Amen. That's faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Problem is, a lot of us, that's too simple. It's too simple, man. Sounds too easy. I like what he's saying, but that means like Jeffrey Dahmer can just ask Jesus Christ to be before he gets electric. Can he go straight to heaven? Yeah. I don't like that. We got to have some rules and regulations. It can't be that free. And we want to put rules and regulations on it. God's work in the hearts of sinners, transforming them by grace is his work alone. It's by grace through faith. Grace alone through faith alone. A gift of God alone, not of works. So this program 
was instituted by God. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach my gospel. He's been giving visions to Peter. He's been talking to Paul, saying to go to the Gentiles. Verse 13, James is going to get up. James is the half-brother of Jesus. Verse 13, let's read what he has to say. And after they had held their peace, he finished speaking, James answered, saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Everybody listens to James. Like I said, James was a half-brother of Jesus. He did not believe Jesus was the Messiah at first until the resurrection. Then he became a believer. In fact, his brother Jude became a believer. Mary, his mother, was a believer. She's in the upper room praying for the Spirit. So he had half-brothers and sisters. There's no such thing in the Bible as the perpetual virginity of Mary. That's a false teaching by the Catholic Church. doesn't exist in the Bible. In the Bible, Mary has other children with Joseph after Jesus is born, born of a virgin. She, was, she, she didn't know a man. Jesus came, then she got married. She had other half-brothers and sisters. They believe in Jesus, and they actually write James and Jude in the New Testament. You can read their epistles. So James was called... Camel knees. He was very pious. He would be on his knees so much that he, grew, he developed calluses on his knees. So he was very geared, had a strong leaning towards the law, grew up in a Torah observant house like Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled all the commandments, was perfect, went to all the feasts, did everything the Old Testament said, and he did it perfectly inside and outside. Now, they always knew they were living with a, two, a goody two sandals, but they didn't know it was God. Until he rose from the dead, and they're like, oy vey, my brother was God. And he visited, Jesus visited him in his resurrected form and freaked him out. And they became zealous for Jesus, zealous for the gospel. So he's very acceptable to the Jewish sentiment about following the Torah. So he was respected immensely by the crowd around him, by the way he lived, by the Jews. He's going to surprise these Jewish priests and these Judaizers here with his judgment on the matter. Verse 14, Simeon, he uses Peter's Jewish name, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out, underline that, take out. Got a question for you, to take out of them a people for his name. When you're done here, some, do, you, do you guys order take out? What do you do? You pick up the phone and you, you make an order, correct? So you initiate the order, right? I'm taking out. I want this, this, and this on the menu, right? And then what do you got to do? You got to go to the place and pay for it and then pick it up, correct? Jesus Christ ordered takeout from this earth. That's us. Amen. When he ordered takeout, that means he said, God said, I'm going to save them. They're going to be mine. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to pay for them in my own blood. They're mine. And then I'm going to take them out of this world and make them a people for me. In fact, I'm going to take out of this world a group called the Ecclesia. Ecclesia is called out. Ek is, is called out of the world. Ek out of. Ecclesia is called. Called out of this world of every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue to be the special bride of Christ, a new creation, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That is what God is doing in the world today. He is taking out a people for his own name. That is what the church is all about. When this church is completed, God will return and take his church to be with him in his father's house. He's preparing a place just like a husband would in a Jewish wedding. And he's taking it back to his father's house. We will return with Jesus when he will set up the kingdom of God on the earth, which will be in Jerusalem, which will be a Jewish kingdom, and Jewish people will be there, and he will rule over the whole earth, and we will help him as his bride, his new creation. We have a wonderful destiny, church, in him. So he agrees with Peter. He says, look, this is a people for God's name. That was the Jewish disciple. He's calling out a people for God's name. That's us. That's what God is doing today in this age of grace. Prior to that, it was faith and works. Faith and becoming Jewish. Faith and following the commandments. Interesting, if you go to Revelation chapter 14, after the church is gone, it says the people who do not take the mark of the beast, they Follow the, they follow faith in Jesus and the commandments of God. You won't find that anywhere else in the New Testament because we follow faith in Jesus. When Jesus takes us, the Holy Spirit leaves this earth as a restraining influence and all the focus goes back on Israel. It's faith and the commandments of God again. It's a different dispensation. 
What is a dispensation? A dispensation basically is how I read the scripture, which is common sense. All scripture is for you, but not all scripture is about you. Let me say that again. All scripture is for you, but not all scripture is about you. A big portion of scripture is about a place called Israel, Jewish people, and Jerusalem. You are not Israel. You are not Jewish. If you're Jewish, it doesn't matter right now because we're all one in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We all belong to Christ. When that church is complete, and it is taken out, God's focus will go back on the nation of Israel and fulfill all those promises in the Old Testament. So you have Old Testament, believers, that's a dispensation. That's been put on hold while the church is being formed. That's a different dispensation, the age of grace we live in now. And then you have the seven years of tribulation, and then you have the millennium, which is another different dispensation of God. All scripture is for you, but it's not all about you because you belong to the place called the church right now. And he's going to say that here in a minute. So God is calling out a people for his name. God is taking them. He's picking them up. He initiated the order, prepared us, came down, paid for us. We're engrafted into the vine of faith. The Israelite nation has been set aside temporarily until God's plan is fulfilled. How do I know that? The next verses prove it. Verses 15 to 18, underline them because if people don't believe, people get angry at, they call you dispensationalist. You believe, basically you believe in the covenants of God. If you do not read the Bible with the covenants of God, you won't understand the Bible. You'll mix them all up. You'll take the things that belong to Israel and make them the church. You'll say the church, the Israel no longer exists and all the curses pertain to Israel, but all the blessings pertain to the church. It's, it's false teaching. They are novices at understanding the Bible. That's basically the problem that we have in churches today. Let me read this for you. This is James speaking, and I think he knows, very Jewish. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, underline after this, after what? After this, after what? Context, go back in context. What are we talking about? The Gentiles. After what? After the Gentiles. After the church. After the Gentiles are gathered in, I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. Which means the Messiah has to come to Israel and rule and reign just like the angel told Mary. He will rule over Israel. Right? Right? That's part of the Messiah's job. That hasn't happened yet. The tabernacles of David are falling down. Jesus Christ has not ruled and reigned from Jerusalem for a thousand years. These things haven't happened yet. After the church, they will happen, is what he's saying. Which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God, are all his works from the beginning of the world. So God had a plan from the beginning of the world. Progressive revelation, the covenants of God, the dispensations of God. Now we're in the age of grace. After this age of grace where God calls out all these Gentiles, he will return and he will build up the nation of Israel once again and he will rule and reign. Now, that's what you call rightly dividing the word of God. Many people look and they say, oh, rightly dividing is comparing scripture with scripture. I beg to differ. Why? Because if you're comparing scripture with scripture, what are you doing? You're adding. You're taking a bunch of scriptures and comparing them together, right? You're adding scriptures together and comparing them all. What is dividing? You're taking scriptures away. You're taking scriptures away and you're putting them in their proper context and for the proper group of people. That's called rightly dividing the word of God. Many people don't rightly divide the word of God, and they don't know where they are in time and eternity. 1948, Israel became a nation again. People will tell you that doesn't mean anything. It means a lot to me because Jesus has to come back there. There has to be a place called Israel. Oh, Thess Thessalonians says that the Antichrist is going to go into a rebuilt temple. How do I know that the Jews are going to put a temple on the Temple Mount? Because it has to be there according to prophecy. That's coming in the future. All the things that are setting up that are around the Middle East right now and the fact that the Jews are still there and the whole world is, is, is in an uproar about it proves that what's coming down is exactly what the scriptures foretell. One day, very soon, the church is going to be taken off the earth in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. 
at the last trump, the dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to go to his father's house and be with him there forever and then come back with him and return to this earth and set up a kingdom for a thousand years. We're also going to see him build a new heaven and a new earth. Those things are all prophesied for the church of Jesus Christ. So there will be one people eventually in the millennium when Jesus rules, there won't be any other religions. Amen? There'll only be Jesus. There'll only be Jesus' people. Everybody will believe because it will be impossible not to believe. That's coming in the future. Interesting, too. Jesus will rule and reign from Jerusalem. The whole world will know the Lord. The whole world will be covered with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, the Bible says. Oh, there will be a highway of holiness to there, to, to, to Jesus. You can go meet Jesus. As a human being, walk to Jerusalem, you know, hey, Jesus, and Jesus will say, what's up? And we'll be flying around in bodies, administering this kingdom with them. Think about the privileges those people will have in that kingdom, growing up in that kingdom. They won't know anything about what we know about. Deception, fake news, all that stuff. They won't know nothing about that. Everything will be righteous and true. Interesting, Satan will be let loose at the end of that thousand years, and even those people will turn on Jesus, proving that the heart of man is what's at the heart of each problem. That's why you need your heart changed. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross to give you a new heart with new desires to make you a new creature in Christ. So Israel's not the church, and the church is not Israel. The church was a mystery hidden in ages past. Two different destinies. Israel has been set aside temporarily until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. God is now taking out a people for himself. God has put his whole program on the Old Testament, put that on hold and said, you know what? It's a small thing that the Messiah will just raise up Israel. He's going to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. I'm going to do something great. I'm going to do something mighty. And I'm going to make sinful human beings take over the spot that the angels left in heaven. I'm going to make them children of heaven. They're going to be new creatures when I'm done with them. Amen? Amen. You're waiting for a new body fashioned like unto Jesus' glorious body. That's our destiny as believers. So he's going to complete that work, the church, and then he's going to remove us. Wars will cease one day. All those things will happen. So the called out ones, the church, are going to administer this kingdom under the Messiah when he comes back to earth. We're going to come with him from heaven. Now God is calling this bride out and it will soon be complete. The church has a different destiny. Most of the trouble in the church doctrinally is not understanding, not rightly dividing this one topic. And why do I go on and on about it? Because I read the Bible verse by verse and in context. The rest of the people are novices. They don't. They don't understand this and they don't rightly divide the word of God. Make sure you understand it in context and make sure you rightly divide it after the church. Interesting too, in the book of Revelation, just another freebie for you. Chapter one, verse 19 gives you the outline of the book of Revelation. People say it's very hard to understand. It says, Write these things, John, Jesus is saying. Write the things which you saw, write the things which are, and write the things which shall come hereafter, metatalta. The things that he saw was Jesus in his resurrected form. He goes over that, chapters 1. Two. Then, then he goes over the things which are. Specifically, it says, the things which are are the churches. And then chapter 4, metatalta twice in, in verse 1, after these things, after the church, after these things, then all hell breaks loose on the planet. After the church is removed. Thessalonians agrees with it. All contexts in the scriptures agree with it. But people want to mix that all up with the nation of Israel. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Let me give you just a few. Just so you have some ammo for your anti-dispensationalist friends, if you have any. I have a few. That's why I jump on this. Romans 11, uh, verses 25 and 26 say this. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, your own proud ideas, that blindness in part has happened to the nation of Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. The new covenant was promised in Jeremiah to the nation of Israel. They refused it. God opened it up to the rest of the world. But he will one day put it upon them. He will save them. They will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Last words of Jesus to his own people were, 
when he was when he was coming into Jerusalem when he said, you know, you will see me again no more until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her chickens, but you wouldn't come. Behold, your house, Israel, is left to you desolate. Desolation, 70 AD, it was destroyed. And you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The Jews in mass through the tribulation will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. That's the point of the tribulation. And to try everyone that dwells upon the face of the earth, Revelation chapter 3. What's the church's destiny? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? We're going to replace those fallen angels and we're going to rule with Jesus. We're going to be joint heirs with God, sons and daughters of the Most High God. You might say, I need more information. Let's go to Ephesians. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3. Let me just highlight some things for you. I don't believe in dispensations. Well, Paul does. Verse 2, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, that's the present circumstance we're under, which is given to me, to you guys, to the Gentiles, the church at Ephesus. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. They didn't know this was coming. It's dispensation of grace. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in the Messiah by the good news of the gospel. Verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. The church was a mystery because if Satan could have seen God, he, he wouldn't have crucified Jesus Christ if he knew that we were going to get saved through it. He's, he's, he's the ultimate tactician, God is. Who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent now that now under the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be be known by the ecclesia, the manifold wisdom of God. We're teaching a lesson to the angels. This mystery was hidden to even them, that God would give a fallen people divine status as his children, and that God would give these creatures eternal life and immortal bodies, new creations in Christ Jesus. God no longer reckons us as humans. We are children of God. Think about that. Direct creations of God by the power of his spirit that resides in you that will one day spring forth into everlasting life. You're going to be immortal and you're going to have a body fashioned like the resurrected body of Jesus when he rose out of the grave. He's going to give that to you. How do you get that? Not by working. That's a whole grace act right there. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? He's a creature, a new creature. You're not the same anymore. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. I could go on. Let me just read 1 John. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the what? Sons and daughters of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it didn't know him. It doesn't recognize who we are. If they knew who we were, they wouldn't treat us the way they do. Beloved, now, at this very moment, you're sons and daughters of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when Jesus appears, we're going to be like him, for we're going to see him as he is. Every man that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. So we want that liberty that's in Jesus Christ. We must look pretty silly to the angels in heaven as we go back under the law, and we don't receive just the grace of Jesus Christ. We're new creations already seated in heavenly places, the Bible says. That's the church's destiny. Verse 19, wherefore, okay, since God already had this plan, we're not fighting against God. We, we understand now that there's a new dispensation. It's grace. They don't have to come under the law anymore. Here's what my judgment is. James making the judgment, not Peter. So if anything, James is the first pope. It's just free information for you. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Let's not hassle them. Who likes that? I do. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled and from blood. Now, when he says strangled, lots of the uh, ancient pagan religions used to boil the animal in its own blood. And then they would eat it. That, to a Jew, they thought the life, they, it told them the life is in the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. Kosher, you bled everything out. You bled all the blood out and you ate kosher. So to them, that was very, very offensive. 
So he's giving them a concession here, James is. Who he says, because the Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. So two things are settled here. One, the doctrinal decision, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, nothing else added. Jesus' finished work is one program for all the called out people. When this program is complete, then he will fulfill the kingdom and bring in the tabernacle of David and raise it up once again. The duty of everyone in a nutshell, that's a believer. Here's, here's your duty as a believer, okay? First thing is stay away from porneo sexual sin. Stay away from sexual sin. It'll attach you to this world. If it's not done under the, under the umbrella of a marriage with a husband and a wife, it is not, if any church teaches that it's a man and a man, they are, they are not part of the church of God because God tells you it's between a male and a female. God made them male and a female, and God ordered the, he was the first one to officiate the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. So he knows what he's doing, okay? Sex is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing, and it's wonderful in the context of a marriage. Two people that commit themselves to one another is also the creation of a family. A man and a man, and a woman and a woman, they cannot make a family, okay? It's an abomination to God. Now, can they be saved? Of course, you turn from that sin. That's idolatry. Homosexuality, fornication, it's all idolatry. It's worshiping the flesh more than the God who created us. It's taking something created and perverting it, which is what all idolatry is. So stay away from sexual sin. It will attach you to this earth. It will defile you and cause a lot of issues in your life. Do I need to opine? First of all, we've got all these sexually transmitted diseases. Happens because a lot of people participate in fornication and in things like that. Destroys families, destroys homes, destroys people. All these kids today, they don't know what sex they are because they don't receive the sex that God gave them. And they're told by other people that they can change their sex. It's destroying our children. Most of them commit suicide. Why? Because you're going against God. You're going against the image that you were created in. You're created in the image of God. You're trying to deface what God made if you do that. Stay away from sexual sin. It'll harm you. It'll hurt you. That's what they did when they went to a lot of their idolatry. They had sexual rites that they had to perform to become part of the, the, the pagan deities that they worship. Venus was worshipped with sexual orgies. There was male and female prostitutes that had to do time in each one of these temples. In each one of these cities, you belonged to a guild. You had to pay money to the local temple. And it was all about sex. It was all about perversion. That's what kept you in the cult. Because it satisfied your flesh. So stay away from sexual sin. Stay away from idolatry. Idolatry is loving anything more than God. Caring about anything more than God. What your driving influence is in life. It can be anything. It can be money. It can be relationships. It can be drug. It can be whatever it is. Whatever gets your mind off of eternity and attaches it to earth is idolatry. Whatever attaches it to heaven, that's walking in the spirit. You follow me? You want to be content? You need to focus on things above, not on things of the earth. Idolatry focuses on creation and the creature. And, and, and worshiping God focuses on the creator and heaven and the spirit life. Basically, we want to follow the spirit life now. We want to follow God. So we have to repudiate that. Now, you're going to struggle with idolatry your whole Christian life because there's a part of our flesh that's attracted to it. That's called sin. And if you confess your sin, the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what we walk in every day. So do yourself a favor. Stay away from those two things. That's all you got to do. Did, did it say you had to kiss my ring? Did it say you had to give me money? Did it say you had to give me 10%? 10% isn't even taught in the New Testament. It's give cheerfully and give what you're able. And give from a cheerful heart. Where'd you get 10%? I got that in the Old Testament and I like it. So let's start at 10%. No. You start at what God tells you to give. Maybe you should be given 50%. I don't know. God will lead you. I don't need to put a thermometer up here and beg you for money because if God's working in here, he'll supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. He's already told me that in his word. Why do I got to beg you for it? Same thing goes with your life. You need to trust God. You need to walk with God. That's much more difficult than trusting a church. 
Much easier if I tell you, you give me 10%, God will definitely bless you and will definitely take care of you. Now you're trusting me. Don't do that. You're trusting God. You, who are you walking with, God or are you walking with a priest? Big, big difference. They're settling this matter right here in chapter 15. Now, James also asked for a concession for them. He said, look, Moses is preaching all these synagogues, so when you go in there, do me a favor. Don't be boiling the lamb and, you know, it's all this blood and all that. It really offends the Jews. They get freaked out by that. You can't do that. Just stop. What does that mean? That means don't take your liberty for granted. I'll give you an example, right? If you as a believer have another new believer over your house and that believer is struggling with alcohol, okay, and you take it as a liberty, I can have a few beers whenever I want. And you start drinking in front of that new believer, and he becomes a full-blown alcoholic and wants to come in and counsel with me. I'm going to send him to your house and tell you to stop drinking in front of him, and you fix him because you broke him. You don't use your liberty to offend anybody else. Okay? Some people are weak in certain areas. Okay? So you don't flaunt your liberty in those areas. Be very careful about how you use your liberty because basically none of our liberty is worth losing a brother over or a sister over, right? So if you, it's okay for you to drink a glass of wine, that's fine. Drink your glass of wine. But don't put it around people that might become full-blown alcoholics if you do it. Use your brain, okay? So when the Jews get offended by this blood strangling, drinking nonsense, like who eats blood pudding? I don't know. They do it in England, but... I never had it. Is it. Did anybody ever have it? Where's the English people? Did, is it any good? Oh, it's very good. See? I'm offended. Now, if that offended me, right? If I was full-blown kosher and I was like, oh, my goodness, Linda's doing this. I'm freaked out, right? Linda would put the, the blood pudding back in the fridge and say, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I pray, I pray you'll forgive me for my blood pudding. You know what I mean? Just be smart about it. Don't do stuff that, like, that, like just ticks people off for no reason. You know, certain people have sensibilities and, and they, get their, 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 they get stumbled very quickly. So don't be offensive, basically. So both sides make concessions. The Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. I bet you all the groups in the churches are like, oh, all the guys were like, the guy standing there with a knife, sharpening them up. Yeah, we're going to get you guys. You know, it's like, nah, I just have to do one verse. That's all I got. No sexual sin, no idolatry. I'm done. See ya. Take, take your Judaize and stuff. Bye. Don't push it on me. Amen. Amen. You could get an infection back in that day and die from that. Simplicity. Verse 22. Don't worry. We're going to race through. Then please the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men. Where are we at? Oh, we got plenty of time. To send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles, elders, and brethren send greeting unto you, the brethren which are of the Gentiles, Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Everybody that's Gentile birth. For as much as we have heard that certain men which went out from us, they went out from Antioch. They troubled you with words subverting your souls or misleading your hearts saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. First of all, we didn't send them. How often people in church, they just rise up on their own and start making trouble in the church without anybody sending them. Happens in a lot of churches. Churches get divided over small stuff. You shouldn't do this. You should worship on Saturday. It says here in the Old Testament. Like I said last week, I came to the Lord. I never went to Bible school or anything. You know, I thought immediately I must get a tattoo about Jesus. That would be showing my faith, right? You look at me like, this guy's an idiot. Well, I don't know. I just like, yeah, you know, momentous time. Let's, let's tag myself. And the guy tells me, oh, and, oh, you can't do that. You can't mark yourself. Look at this portion of scripture. And I read it. And I was like, oh, oh I'm going to hell now. I got that too. I better get a room. Until I started reading further on, you have to keep your hair a certain way. And I started delving into this. I started realizing that's not what saves you. Jesus Christ is what saves you. You got a tattoo? What are you going to, everybody with a tattoo gets the second class heaven trip? The rest of you non-tattoo people get first class heaven seats? Doesn't work that way. So stop it. They trouble. They subvert you. They freak you out. They freak you out. They set up priesthoods. Most of it's over money, I got to tell you. To this day and age, people rather be led by somebody who takes their money because they believe if they pay money, they get something in return for it. You cannot buy salvation and you can't buy the Holy Spirit. That ain't ever going to happen. You have to give your heart to the Lord. 
So they're troubling you. They're subverting you. 25, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas, Barney, and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they, they say, look, these leaders set their seal on Barnabas and Paul, saying these men risked their lives for Jesus. They call them beloved. So what a testimony to their witness and what they were teaching. Verse 27, we've also sent Judas and Silas, which will also tell you the same thing. So we sent more people, not just them. We're sending you these letters, and we're sending you an official delegation to end the matter once and for all. So important for us. I'm so glad they had this. Otherwise, this argument would still be raging today. People still let it play today. Verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. I love that. Underline this verse. This is how you should make decisions that you don't have anything in the Bible about. Or decisions that contradicting doctrines or you don't know what's, what, what, what you should do. Like when we moved here, there wasn't like a light that went from Tannersville to this Scioto place and said, moo. I didn't know. I could have been making a mistake. It's been borne out over time that this was where we should be. God honored it and God moved and God opened the doors. We went through them. Sometimes you don't know. So you have to do things that are pure means there's nothing in the scripture that says they're not. Don't do anything that the scriptures tell you not to do, first and foremost. So the decision that you're making, if you don't know where you should move, what you should do, or if everybody should move to Texas, because I hear Texas is like seceding, so I'm, I'm thinking about moving the whole church down there. But <laughs> the Lord told me no. That was just my flesh. We're staying here. We're fighting the Alamo, baby. We're not leaving. Uh, but, you know, making decisions like that in your life, if it's pure, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't do it. If it's peaceable, which means you got a peace about it, and it's easily entreated, which means you're going to suffer. There's always going to be trouble in any decision, but if it's easily entreated, which means that you're able to do it without hurting people or killing people, walk through the door. That's an open door in my book. So, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Pray. If you've got a peace about it with the Holy Spirit, go ahead and do it. It seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So there's many times when a decision you can't find in Scripture, where you should live, what you should wait on, where you should go, the best way is just to pray, and not lay unnecessary burdens on others, and do what God tells you to do. But it will be peaceful. Look what 29 31 says, and we'll close. That you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, that's for the Jewish believers. And from fornication, that's for you guys. From which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. Verse 29, imagine reading that as a Gentile believer and saying, wow, man, I got the whole Old Testament. I'm just going to live by this one verse. That's how easy Christianity is supposed to be. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitudes together, they delivered this epistle, this letter, which when they had read it, all the guys are standing there getting ready for their operation, and they're like, yes, operation's canceled. They're, they're happy. You would be too if you were a Gentile man in that day. Two things were accomplished in a practical way. First of all, the strength and the unity of the church kept it from dividing and splitting into two camps, law versus grace. They didn't compromise any doctrine to do this. They gained a better understanding of who Jesus was, the work that he was doing, the dispensations of God, and the grace of God, how powerful the grace of God is in our lives. Amen. So problems and differences of opinion can lead to greater growth and a greater understanding of who Jesus is. The Bible says we're supposed to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means every time you fail, who here has sinned since you've asked Christ to be your Savior? Is everybody in this room born again? Anybody who's not sure? Raise your hand if you're not sure. Very good. If you're not sure, here's how you get saved. I'm going to give you the gospel, okay? And I'm going to give everybody else the gospel who wasn't, who wasn't courageous enough to raise their hand if they're not sure, okay? Here's how you get saved. You come to Jesus by faith. And you say, Father, I believe you sent your son Jesus the creator of all things, he became a man, one of, one of us. He lived perfectly on this earth. Father, I want his blood applied to my life. I want you to forgive my sins. I repent of my sins. I repent of the things that I've done wrong. I repent of the way I'm living. I repent of my idolatry. I repent of the things that I've trusted in, the things that I hope for in this world that are never going to satisfy me. I give that all to you. I ask you forgive me of my sins. I ask you to receive me just as I am. 
I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me your son, make me your daughter. If you've prayed that prayer, even now, the Lord has touched your life and you are saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means your destination is heaven. Now, everything is up to God to get you there. Okay? If you've done that, please come up. I'll give you a Bible. I want to give you a Bible. For the rest of us, here's how you grow in grace. When you make a mistake, when you fail, when you sin, when you slip into idolatry, when you slip into sexual sin, you immediately confess your sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If there's anything in your life that you have right now that is not congruent with walking in the spirit and walking with the Lord, right now just say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin, restore right relationship, renew unto me those things that I've, 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 I've thrown aside, and fellowship is restored. Salvation is not an issue for you. It's your fellowship with God that you need to reignite. A lot of people are walking around with idols in their life, and they don't smash them. We don't put them down. That's why we lack power in the body of Christ. Let's stand. We'll pray. Father God, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for people that are honest enough to say, hey, I struggle with assurance. And Lord, we sing a song called Blessed Assurance, that Jesus, you're mine. And that's the foretaste of the glory divine. We're heirs of salvation, purchased of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Lord, that's the story of each one of us, Lord. Help us to grow in that grace and the knowledge of who you are. Forgive us for making these things uh, man-centered instead of walking in your light and walking by your spirit. Teach us how to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are. Father, I pray that you'd give that assurance to all of your struggling children that doubt sometimes your love that doubt your care for them, Lord. But Father, if you offer Jesus up for us all, how will you not freely give us all things through him? If you began the work, you said you'd be faithful to complete it. We cast ourselves, Lord, on you, Lord, on your care. And we have faith that you're going to accomplish what you started in each one of our lives. Lord, I lift up anyone in this room who does not know you, Lord, that today would be the day that they connect with you internally, Lord, and you save them thoroughly. Seal them, Lord. I pray for some of us here, Lord, who've been walking with you a long time and we're a little bit, um, how to say it, Lord, a little bit prideful. Think we know everything. Think we're a bunch of know-it-alls, Lord. And we don't give grace out anymore. We don't love like we used to love. And Father, you said to the church of Ephesus, Lord, return. You've left your first love. Go back to the beginning. Go back to the wonder of it all. Go back to when we got saved. And Lord, start from that point again. Lord, I pray that we would all do that today, Lord. We lift our hearts to you. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do. We pray for this church that we would be a light, salt and light to the rest of this world around us, that there'd be a great ingathering, Lord, and that you'd come quickly for your church. We pray in your name. Amen.